ladies and gentlemen. Um, it gives me um, great pleasure as Registrar and CEO of the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies to welcome you here this evening uh, to our Theoretical Physics Public Statutory Lecture. Um, I'd like to extend um, just a special welcome to uh, a number of people um, uh, in the audience. We have a number of public representatives with us, but I'd like in particular to welcome uh, Eamon O'Keefe, uh, TD, obviously grandson of Eamon de Valera, who set up DIA, so thank you very much for taking the time. And I know there's one or two others also here, so thank you for taking the time. I believe it's very busy um, across the road uh, this evening. Um, I'd also like to uh, particularly welcome uh, Professor Pat Gary, uh, the Science Secretary from the Royal Irish Academy, and indeed to thank the Academy uh, for making uh, the venue available to us this evening uh, for the lecture. Um, some of you will know, but I suspect most of you won't know, uh, that when Professor Erwin Schrodinger arrived in Ireland, uh, the Institute for Advanced Study Act hadn't been passed. So in fact, he spent a period of time giving lectures here at the Academy, and I just learned this evening, actually was made an honorary professor of the Academy. So I think it's very fitting, in fact, that we're here this evening on this special occasion for, for the lecture. So thank you very much indeed uh, for, for having us. Um, I'd also like to welcome um, a representative from the um, Austrian Embassy, uh, uh, Ms. Stephanie Winkler. Um, we're obviously delighted to have you here this evening on this special occasion. Um, for those of you who maybe are not familiar with DICE, so I'll just say a, a quick word uh, about uh, who we are. Um, I, I described it earlier that we do, in effect, what it says on the tin, to use that phrase from advertising, we are an institute for advanced, advanced studies. We're Ireland's only institute for advanced studies, and in fact we were the second institute of advanced studies set up in the world. Following, we followed the establishment of the Princeton Institute for Advanced Studies uh, back in the late 1930s, and we were established in 19, 1940. Um, we are a specialist uh, research institution, uh, 120 souls doing fundamental and uh, discovery uh, research. Um, following, I suppose, the tradition from the very beginning, uh, when there was a lot of global interaction and a lot of uh, people coming in from other countries to do the research and a lot of exchanges, that still actually continues very much at the Institute, which is exemplified, I think, very nicely by the fact that um, following in the footsteps of Professor Erwin Schrodinger, who of course was the first director of the School of Theoretical Physics at the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies, we have at the moment as our director, uh, Professor uh, Werner, Ber 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 Werner Nam, and uh, Werner and Professor Schrodinger have in common the fact that they each would have received uh, the Max Planck Medal, um, which is a very prestigious um, award to receive and in fact, there only has been three people actually on the island of Ireland that have held it. All three have actually been professors at the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies. So there's a nice, I think, a nice synergy, uh, a nice synergy there. Um, we have a strong legacy uh, in discovery uh, research. Um, a number of people have said to me actually outside, well, you know, we don't hear very much about you. Um, that is true, but we are going to change that because we actually have been doing some really fantastic stuff in the last 20-30 um, uh, years. Um, we've been very involved in uh, space uh, research, have a number of firsts. We were involved first in having experiments on uh, spacecraft Apollo 16. We were the first uh, Irish institution to have an experiment on the space station. I could go on and on. Uh, but I just wanted to give you um, a flavour of that. We were the entity that actually did the big project looking at the formation of the Atlantic Ocean. We led it. Uh, we did collaborate with other institutions, which actually discovered that Ireland's rights in terms of uh, its, 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 its legal rights from the point of view of its boundaries out into the Atlantic Ocean went further than we thought. And effectively, uh, the research that we did led to uh, Ireland's territory being increased by tenfold. Again, very few people know that. Uh, so over the years we have done research which didn't start out uh, to, I suppose, have those kinds of impacts, but ultimately actually did. 
Um, you will have seen more recently then uh, perhaps uh, some coverage around work that we're involved in currently. And I'll just give you just a couple of examples. Um, we're involved with a big project putting ocean bottom seismometers out into the Atlantic Ocean, uh, which will uh, detect seismic activity in the Atlantic Ocean. And I think one of the headlines actually back a few months ago when it was launched was something like pilot tsunami warning system being established by DIAS. So and that, it, that is one of the functions uh, of, that, of that infrastructure, which will be utilised from scientists from all over the world. We're involved in the fact the uh, uh, co-principal investigator of a major project uh, where we are actually um, uh, working to develop satellite but out into space to look for exoplanets where those are planets where there might be life uh, is actually a big project with us at the moment and Professor Tom Ray is actually here somewhere in, in, in the audience is involved with that and we're working on that with uh, ECL in London and we have a big project that was in the news also recently around digitising uh, manuscripts um, Trinity have an exhibition on at the moment of some of their manuscripts and as part of that there is a marking of 20 years of collaboration of research being done by our Celtic scholars in Dias and also work that we have done um, uh, looking at the manuscripts, manuscripts digitising them and making them accessible worldwide. Last year our Irish script on screen uh, infrastructure or portal had over 5 million hits from all over the world. So what we're doing is making Celtic studies and Celtic material very, very accessible. I could go on, but we need to get on with this evening's proceedings. Today we are here, I suppose, looking back and we're marking a very special um, uh, anniversary. Uh, 75 years ago, Professor Erwin Schrodinger delivered a series of lectures called, now the what, well, and at the time and now called the What is Life? What is Life Lectures? Those lectures were given as part of Dias's Theoretical Physics Public Statutory Lecture Series. So the, the, the lecture series that in fact we are starting for this year today. Those lectures were delivered in Trinity and there was great interest in the time, uh, at the time in them. There was a publication subsequently. And subsequent to that, uh, it became clear uh, from uh, correspondence between the, the discoverers of DNA and Professor Schrodinger that in fact his work had been very influential and then had inspired them. We earlier today had a small ceremony where the letter, uh, the famous, uh, those in the field will, will know about this and those that aren't won't, the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a famous letter that um, Professor Crick, uh, one of the discoverers of DNA, wrote to Professor Schrodinger mentioning the fact that himself and Professor Watson had been talking about how they had come up with their conclusions and referencing the fact that they actually had been inspired by the different thinking, if you like, that Professor Schrodinger, who was a physicist, had had and actually had published and that actually had led, had led them down a certain track. That letter, which dies as the original of, we actually gave on loan earlier today at lunchtime to the Little Museum of Ireland so they can include it uh, in their exhibit for uh, a year and therefore make that very important contribution by um, thinking and work done in Ireland accessible to, to the public. I encourage you to pick up our programme. We have some other events coming up, I won't go through them, but I encourage you to pick up one of the leaflets actually on your, on your way out. So without further ado, uh, I'm actually going to uh, just invite um, our Director of the School of Theoretical Physics, <coughs> Professor uh, Werner Nam, uh, to say a few words and then to introduce our very special um, um, guest speaker uh, this evening, um, uh, Professor uh, Terence, Terence Rudolph. When you look at the title uh, Professor Terry Rudolph gave, uh, it's a little bit weird, and there's a good reason for it. Uh, quantum mechanics is weird, and uh, that's one of the things to, to know about quantum mechanics. And you all have heard about Schrodinger's cat being alive and dead at the same time. Uh, the other feature of quantum mechanics, it's very close to, to engineering and technology and all that. Schrodinger, when he gave the lectures, what is life, uh, thought that maybe it's, it's fundamental for life. This is not quite true. Uh, life 
mostly only makes use of ordinary chemistry, which of course also is based on, on quantum mechanics, but there are certain features like uh, the light harvesting system of uh, photosynthesis, which uses very specifically uh, the weird features of uh, quantum physics, uh, Terry Rudolph will, will talk about. Now, uh, this double thing, uh, one uh, strange and deep uh, philosophical questions and closeness to engineering uh, actually uh, formed his career. Uh, he was oscillating uh, between uh, technology and academia. Uh, he uh, got his PhD at, uh, in Toronto in, in Canada. Then he moved to Bell Labs, uh, unfortunately, uh, a decade after uh, Bell Labs, by, by politics, uh, lost its, its spite in a way. Uh, you, well, uh, cell phone, transistor, and all things uh, were, were invented at, at Bell Labs. And the best thing a physicist could do when he wanted to do something really important was to go there. But uh, that's no longer true. So uh, he uh, got uh, to, uh, to Imperial College and gave an inaugural lecture there, uh, which is very well worth uh, looking at. I, I just was, was reminded that it has uh, about 700,000 hits on, uh, on the internet. And uh, it covers a, a wide range of things uh, from uh, Luke Skywalker in the beginning uh, to, uh, to raindrops, monkeys, and, and what else. But uh, it's, it's quite deep. And in, in fact, uh, already in, in, in his early years, uh, uh, when, when you uh, look at the papers, uh, Terry Rudolph uh, wrote at the time, uh, uh, you have this mixture of uh, funny uh, topics and uh, deep thinking. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, when you are abducted by terrorists and put in a room without windows, uh, but you have a state with you with it entangled with a uh, state outside, uh, can you communicate your position uh, to someone who's, who's going to help you? So it, it's a nice paper, fairly short and uh, fun to read. Uh, but uh, then uh, later on, uh, it was one of the, the authors of, of quite uh, famous uh, theorem, uh, PBR theorem, where R stands for Rudolph, uh, which shows, uh, well, uh, to some sense that all matter, even per perfectly ordinary matter, has to take part in, in the weirdness uh, of, of quantum mechanics uh, if you assume that you have no faster than light communication. And, uh, so, and, and nowadays uh, we uh, consider uh, Newton's action as a distance as, as too weird uh, to, to complicate. So, uh, times have changed uh, in a way. Uh, but, uh, well, at, at the moment, uh, Terry Rudolph is at an extended sabbatical uh, from Imperial uh, to Silicon Valley, uh, pursuing one particular idea uh, to build a quantum computer. And uh, many people think that this will be the next and an extremely important engineering feat uh, for applications of, of quantum mechanics. And, uh, he certainly is, is optimistic uh, that it, it will happen in his lifetime. I, I would be very happy if it happened in my lifetime. <laughs> well, uh, okay, that's enough. And uh, look, look at his inaugural lectures for Imperial College. And well, I hope you will enjoy this lecture today. <laughs> Turn this on. I have to open it. No, it's not. Is there a I did open it before. Oh, here it is. Oh, Sorry, Beth. Thank you. Fortune.
for that kind introduction, and I should start by thanking uh, Dias for inviting me here to be part of this special occasion and for their hospitality. This is only the second time I've been in Dublin, and uh, the first time I was with my brother, it was about 15, 20 years ago, and there were a lot more pubs involved. Um, so this time I'm, I'm happy to be here in this sort of more work context, and to be part of celebrating this uh, famous series of lectures, What is Life, that you just heard about. And my goal in this talk is that you leave here realizing that the lectures, What is Life, and there was an essay, if you buy the book, you normally get this essay, Mind and Matter, um, that, was, that was published a few years later that these were not the product of some aging scientist who was sort of going a little bit crazy. As you get older in science, and I feel this myself, you get more and more desperate to do you know, crazy things, and then you get more frustrated with the mundane things, and so you, you do crazier things. But I'd like you to leave this lecture convinced that the, the seeds of, of even the essay Mind and Matter came from the very basics of quantum theory. Okay. When Schrodinger was, was looking at the very fundamentals of quantum theory, he was already having to think about the nature of mind and how it connects to the physical world. So that's my goal. Unfortunately, the only way that you can really understand that is to know quantum theory. And so, Normally in such lectures, people will, will talk with a lot of allegories and give some analogies and, and give you sort of vague sounding things. And I decided, no, I'm just going to teach you quantum theory. Okay. So some of you who, who came here for a nap and then have a nice glass of wine, uh, that's not going to happen. You're going to have to learn some quantum theory. Okay. You might have to lock the doors. All right. So the basic equation of quantum theory is here. This is Schrodinger's grave uh, in Alpac, which is a beautiful village in the Tyrol. If I zoom in a little bit, you can see here the famous Schrodinger equation. This was the equation that kind of sent this whole uh, approach to quantum theory go. And by the end of the lecture, I'm hoping that this equation, even if you've studied no quantum theory in your life, that it makes some kind of sense to you. Okay. So, the way I'm going to uh, go about it is to start by giving you a series of thought experiments, sort of slightly idealized experiments, and then I'm going to explain mathematically how we describe the outcomes of those experiments. And I promise you it's not going to take anything more than the, than the basic uh, arithmetic that you learned you know, in your late primary school, early high school. But it might take a little bit of concentration. So the other thing to say is, although these are thought experiments, we really, unless quantum theory fails, we could really do them almost exactly as I described them. And uh, in fact, I've, I've been involved in, in doing experiments that are very similar to these. So the thought experiments are going to start with a system that's just a ball. And this ball can be black or white. And you shouldn't think of this as a microscopic ball, it could be any ball, but you can identify the color. The, the experiments that I've done on this, uh, it was actually, you could see it with the naked eye, but it was sort of red and green color. Okay. And this idealized thing, partly because I hate the colors, I'm going to do everything in black and white. Okay? So we have a ball, it can be either black or white, and it, it can only be one, you know, sort of these two particular states, we call them. And um, what we can do with a ball like this is we can change the color by some kind of physical mechanism, some kind of interaction. And so this here is a sort of idealized experiment that takes a white ball in and you just drop it through a hole in the top of this box here and it comes out black. I'm going to call this the not box. In fact, depending on which type of experimental physics you do, people have lots of different names for this box. But in the area I work in, which is, which is quantum information, 
We just call it the not box because all that goes in white comes out not white, i.e. black. We're not very really imaginative people. So that has many other names. Okay, so a not box, it's very easy to describe the rule. It basically flips the color. So if you drop in a black ball, it comes out white. If you drop in a white ball, it comes out black. So your first test, you thought you were coming to a public lecture, but really you've come to a lesson on quantum theory. Okay, the first test question is, what color does this ball come out of? Here? White. White. Okay. It comes out white because, so I've just connected the, the output of this box with the input of this box. The white ball falls through. At this point, it's black falls through again, and it comes out white. Okay. Um, and clearly, if I do the converse, if I drop in a black ball, it flips to white here, and then it comes out black. So, in quantum theory, there's a box we can build that has slightly crazy behavior. Okay. The name that's normally given to this box, well, depends a little bit on what field you're in, a bit like the knot box, and it's not very informative, and it's too long for me to draw on a slide. So I'm just going to name this box after my friend Pete, who's also a bit crazy. Okay. You can just think of, of this box as being named after whoever's the craziest person you know. Okay. It's not the name of something which, which will make it crazy. So the Pete box uh, can also just take a single ball in, in this case a white ball, Drop it in. But the peat box, when you look at the color of the ball that comes out, it's just completely random whether it's black or white. You drop it in, sometimes it comes out white, sometimes it comes out black. Okay, and so we just drop in lots of white balls, and they just come out randomly black and white. And we test and we make sure it's completely random. We try everything to see if there's any patterns in what comes out. Nothing, no patterns, comes out randomly black or white. Okay. So, you can also drop in black balls, and they also come out randomly black and white. Okay. No pattern, no rhyme or reason, every ball you drop in just comes out randomly black or white. Okay, so, one question, I guess, that, that you can ask when you see this is, you know, is this randomness really fundamental? And, of course, it, it would be interesting if there's sort of fundamental randomness in the world, but how strange is it really? I would argue that it's not that strange. Okay, you can imagine that the, the inner workings of the people, I've just told you what happens to the balls that go in and out, but if you wanted to, you, you could come up with a theory for what happens inside the box. Okay. And the theory you might come up with um, might be like this. I should have given this guy a hat and called him a leprechaun, I guess. You can imagine that inside the peat box, there's a leprechaun. And the leprechaun flips a coin. So here's a flipped coin. And if the coin shows heads, the leprechaun sticks a knot box in the path of the ball. Okay. Conversely, if the, if the coin shows tails, the leprechaun does not put the knot box in the way. And so you can imagine that, that you know, every time you drop a ball in, the leprechaun sees it coming, flips a coin, and decides whether or not to put the knot box in. And unless you can look in the box and see the leprechaun, you know, that box behaves exactly the same as the peat box that I've just described. So if this was what really happened inside the peat box, uh, you know, we wouldn't be that excited. It wouldn't cause us to radically change our view of the world. But in fact, the peat box does cause us to radically change our view of the world. And that's what I, the first part of this lecture, I'd really like to convince you of. Okay, so how do we know um, what's going on in the peat box? It turns out it's very difficult to break them open. Uh, here's a question similar to the one I asked previously, which is, here I stack two P boxes. The output of one goes to the input of the other. So what color will the ball come out from the bottom of the second P box? Black. Okay. 
we don't know, black or white, random, okay? That is the logical thing that should happen, but that is not what happens. When you stick a white ball in the top of two people, it always comes out white. Okay. So, this, um, you know, you start stacking them up, you think like, what the heck's going on here? The reason why the natural answer, the logical, sensible answer, is that it comes out black or white. You, you think, well, you know, it emerges from the first peat box, black or white, okay? Don't know which. But regardless of what the input color is to a peat box, it comes out randomly black or white. So it makes sense that it should just come out from the bottom here, black or white, okay? That's logical. You can do the same thing with a black ball. You can put a black ball in the top. Always comes out black. Okay. Now, as scientists, when you when you, you're confronted with such a thing, you know what do you do? Well, you, you really want to work out what's going on in the peat box. And as I said, it's not actually easy to break them open. In fact, we can't break them open and see what's really going on. Okay. So what we try and do is we try and peek. We pull the boxes apart slightly. Okay. We shine in some light. And we look to see what the color of the ball is between the two peak boxes. Okay. Because we, you know, something weird must be going on between the two boxes. So let's have a look and see if we can see something that's going on. And what we find now is uh, quite remarkable. We find that now, regardless of what color we drop in the top, the ball emerges randomly black or white again. Our process of looking at what color the ball has between the two boxes causes it to, to stop being deterministically white to white and black to black and become random again. So, you know, what is the kind of thing that we do? Well, the, we think like, oh, well, maybe the thing that we're doing, you know, maybe the torch and the light and stuff is, is messing the whole thing up. So we try to turn it down to, you know, a dimmer brightness or change the way that we do something else to try and, and sort of be less invasive. And we find the following. We find that if you make the, the method of probing what's going on between the two boxes so weak that you no longer can tell what the color is, then it'll just always come out for one color. But as soon as whatever method you're using to look at what's going on can tell you what the color is, um, then you go back to being randomly black or white. And this is really a break from our view of the classical world. In classical physics, we could talk about the motions of the planets and uh, you know, fluid dynamics or whatever it is and not have to worry about our role. Okay, we don't have to worry that when we're looking at Jupiter that's suddenly kicking Mars out of orbit or something crazy. Okay. But here, no matter how we try and see what's going on, our process of observation is having some effect on the world. So that's the, what we would call the operational description. That's the set of experiments we do. Okay. What I'm going to teach you now is the mathematical way that quantum theory describes what's going on in those experiments. Okay. Over the years, many, many people, including myself, have tried to come up with an alternative <coughs> description. And sometimes you come up with things that look um, very different to what I'm about to show you, but you find out either that they're the same, but just in some non-obvious way, or that they're wrong, that they disagree with the experiment. What I'm going to tell you now is the only way that actually works. Okay? A small caveat for people who work. It's the only way that works when you have more than one ball. Okay? If you have only one ball, that is alternative explanations, but once we start doing things with more peat boxes and more balls, what I'm about to show you is the only way that works. <laughs> so here we go. The way 
that quantum physics says to describe what's going on in the peak box is the following. It says, you drop in a white ball, and what comes out of the bottom of the peak box is something that I'm just going to call a misty state, or a quantum state. I'm going to call it, I'm going to draw a cloud around it, and then I call it a misty state because it's very mysterious. But all this state has is it has, a, it has a list within it of possible colors of the ball. In this case, the ball can be white or black. Okay. But we know that in some sense, this ball is not white or black. Otherwise, we would have had a simple explanation of the two peat boxes experiment. Okay. So you have to think of this as something else that, that, that is like a list of alternatives. But in many other ways, it really behaves like when you make a list of you know, all the possible drinks you might have tonight. I might have wine or beer or whatever. You know, it's just a list, a comma-separated list. And just like a list like that, the order doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you put black first or white first. But the, the special thing about this list is the following. If you drop a black ball there, then the list has a minus sign in front of the black ball. This is the, the unique distinguishing feature of, of what's going on here. This negative sign, you know, you cannot have a, a negative whiskey in your list of drinks. But here, the unique feature of quantum theory is that you can have like a negative black hole. Okay. And you shouldn't think of this as a negative charge or anything. You should think of this as just a label. It's, it's some kind of label that behaves like a minus sign from mathematics. <laughs> and in fact, understanding this and then generalizing it is all you need to do all of quantum theory. This has only been known for about 10 years that this is all that we need. Um, but I think it's pretty cool. OK, so what we need to understand next, if we're going to sort of really understand the two peat boxes experiment mathematically, is how do you act things like other boxes on this misty state, on this kind of quantum state? Okay? And the rule is very simple. It's just, well, you have a list of, that you can think of as these are the possible inputs. And you take each element of the list and act on it by whatever the rule was for that box. Okay, so the rule for, for the not box was that if you drop a white ball in, it falls through and comes out black. And the rule was for the not box was that if you drop the black ball in, it comes out white. Okay. So you just it's, it's just an algorithm. It's just I tell you how this box works, and then you can act on it. On the simple. And remember, I said that the order doesn't matter, so this input state is actually the same as the output state. The not box does nothing on the misty state of a white and a black ball. Okay. Now, obviously, we, we have to be careful not to look at this state before we drop it in to the box. Right? If, we, if we go and we look at this state, we observe it then we will see it as either white or black. Okay. So in fact, doing these experiments takes, takes some care. You have to protect the system, in this case the ball, uh, from the mist just kind of disappearing. Now, if you drop in this mist, so the, this, would, remember, was the mist that comes out of the peat box if you drop a black ball into the peat box. So if you took that particular state, drop it through the not box, well, the white becomes black, and the black becomes white. This shows you that the negative sign can apply to either white or black. Okay? It's not that black is in any way special. You can have a negative white ball. Um, the negative sign looks black, that's because I tried to do it picking up what you could see. But the negative sign can be on any kind of configuration of colors. <laughs> All right. So how does this description, this diagrammatic language, this mathematics, explain the two peat boxes experiment? Let's look at what happens. So this is the output from the first peat box. 
Okay? I dropped a white ball into the first peat box. The rule for the first peat box was the white ball becomes this mist of white and black. And now we're looking at what happens when I drop this into the second peat box. Well, the rule is, you apply whatever the rule is for the peat box to each individual element of that configuration. So the white ball goes through the peat box and splits up into kind of the white, black mist. That's what white balls do going through a peat box. And the black ball goes through and splits up into a white, negative black mist. That's what black balls do going through a peat box. Now, we clearly have something that's a more complicated object. It's like a big mist and then some little mists around it. And you know, you might say, okay, this is where things become complicated. Okay. But they really get no more complicated than basic arithmetic. And to convince you of that, I'll now show you just this you should think of as an analogy from basic arithmetic. The rules that you already know from basic arithmetic. Think of the edge of the mist as like the brackets. I've got a big bracket around this thing. And think of the number two as like the white ball and the number five is like a black ball. Okay. These are physical objects, they are balls, they are not the numbers. You don't get, like I'm, I'm trying to show you that the rules of what we do are plausible and the same as basic arithmetic, but do not go away from here going, Perry thinks white balls are the number two. Okay. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just trying to show you a rule and show you that it makes sense, plausibly. Okay. So if you have to do this, math as mathematics, you know, oh, well, I can drop these brackets. And I get 2 plus 5 plus 2 minus 5. And the 5s cancel each other out. Okay. Similarly, this here obeys the exact same rules. It's great. We can't make these rules up. Nature has chosen them for us already. We get the white, the black, the white again, and the negative black. And then the black and the negative black cancel each other out. This is a cancellation of the balls. And it's the real role of this minus sign. And so all you get left with in the mist is a white ball. Two options for a white ball. And this is why, so remember, this was the second peat box. I put a white ball in. It came through the first peat box. This was the input to the second peat box. When you look at the output from the second peat box, you only see a white ball. That's quantum theory in a nutshell. You can do the same thing for, I put a black ball in the first peat box, it comes through, it's white, common, negative black, so now it goes into the second peat box, and now the white goes to white, comma, black. This black goes to white, common, negative black, and you should think of the edges of the mist are like the brackets again. And you know from basic mathematics that if you have the negative of something in brackets, <laughs> that you apply the minus sign, you sort of expand it through the numbers. Okay. So this negative in brackets outside these two becomes a negative white ball. And here is the magic of, of quantum theory. I get a negative negative, okay, a double negative. And that gives me a positive black ball. And so again, in this case, I get interference. Okay. Interference is, is the sort of first key magical ingredient of quantum theory. I get the white cancels with the negative white, and now I only see a black ball in the bottom. Okay. That's how simple quantum theory is. Okay. Let me take you back to the equation that's on Schrodinger's grave, okay. which, you know, if you haven't studied quantum mechanics, this just looks like a bunch of weird symbols. Okay. This sign symbol is this. It's just that mathematical object. You can think of it as a list of a possible configuration or something. It just has some weird properties. You get negative black balls and so on. But that's all that psi is. The quantum state, or what I sometimes call the misty state. Okay. This, the H, is a symbol that depends on which particular box 
you are looking at. So this age actually changes depending on whether you're talking about a knot box or a feed box, or there's actually many other boxes. Particularly, we can do boxes that take in two balls and two, two different, like lots of different colors for them. H really depends on the bond. It's H uh, because the, the, this quantum object uh, was very closely related mathematically to an object discovered by uh, William Rowan Hamilton, who's one of Ireland's great mathematicians in, in the early 1800s. Okay, so it's H for Hamilton. It's, it's a slightly different object, but it's, it looks very really similar, and it's sort of how Schrodinger came up with it. So H describes the box. Psi describes the state. Okay. And then the whole equation is just literally the rule that I told you now. The whole equation says, how does the state change as I go through the box? That's it. That's the Schrodinger equation. You don't even have to go to university anymore. You can go tell people you understand what it means. <laughs> All right, so let me just sort of summarize where we're at so far. Here are our sort of basic processes. We have a peat box where if you drop in a ball of, of one color, it comes out randomly. Two peat boxes, you drop in one, always comes out the same. If you have two peat boxes, but you look at the color, then it comes out randomly again. Okay, those are our basic uh, sort of summary of where we're at so far. Now, if you're uh, still awake, and I hope you are, you might be wondering, like, is this really necessary? Is it necessary that it's you looking between the boxes? Is it possible for me to just replace you with some kind of machine, some kind of device that looks at the ball between the boxes? Okay, that's a natural thing. I said, you look at it, and then you, you know, you see, like, oh, it's white or it's black. But what you know, maybe, maybe you know, maybe this is the lazy grad student who wants to go down to the pub and they want to set a machine up to do the observation instead. Okay. So I'm going to talk you through what happens if you replace you with the machine. So we have a machine. This is my, as you can tell, I'm no artist. This is my uh, depiction of a machine that has like a little window here that can look at the color of a ball. Okay, so light comes in. And the machine just has a pointer that has three positions that it can point to. Okay, and each position is labeled, oh, it's white, or it's black, or I don't know what the color is. Okay. It's a very simple device. And what we want to understand is, what if I replace you making the observation of the ball between the two peat boxes with the machine making the observation of the ball between the two peat boxes? Okay. Now, if it's you that makes this observation, well then you get randomly black or white here. So what happens when the machine makes the observation? Well, you still get randomly black or white. It seems like you're not that special after all. And what I really, my, my hope, the one takeaway message from this talk that I hope everyone gets is that, in fact, the laws of quantum physics really treat these two cases differently. Even though we see the same kind of thing here, we see that the, the machine being the observer and you being the observer lead to the same um, observations. Okay, we see the same thing happen. It's all, it's, it comes out randomly. Again. The machine looked at the color. Quantum physics, for reasons we don't understand, treats the machine differently to you. Okay. And you know, in terms of the theme of this talk, Schrodinger was one of the first people to understand that. And so thinking about the difference between a machine and a human observer is sort of key to, I think, many of the things that came on later in this career. Okay, so what then, how does quantum physics explain what happens when the machine does the observation instead of the human doing the observation? Okay. Well, it goes something like this. You have the standard scenario, so I drop a white ball into a peat box. I have this mist. No one is looking at it yet. Okay. I bring the machine in, and then I turn on the light. Okay. And now what happens? So, you know, the rules as I've presented them to you so far seem a bit arbitrary. It's like, it seems like Terry's just making stuff up. But, in fact, 
there is only one way of, of working out what happens, and that is to go to the Schrodinger equation and actually solve it. Sometimes that's easy, sometimes that's hard. We spend a lot of our lives trying to solve this equation, but in this case, we can solve it. And remember, it will tell us what happens when any kind of things interact with each other. And what it tells us is that this does not evolve to being a white or a black ball, which is what it would, which is what would happen if you looked at the color of the ball, according to quantum theory. What it tells us is that it just evolves to a bigger mist like this. So, so I, here I had this kind of misty state that has like just a single ball in it. Now I have a mist that has two objects in it. But it's still just a list of kind of possible configurations of stuff in the world. Okay. In this case, the ball, there's a configuration where the ball is white and the machine, so here the machine started off pointing to the, I don't know what the color is, okay, because it didn't know what the color was. Now it points to saying, oh, I know that, that the color is white. But there's another sort of configuration in the mist where the ball is black, and the machine points to the label that says, oh, I know the ball is black. And the Schrodinger equation says that this is the kind of big output mist that comes out of, the, of this process. So remember the, the, the name of the game is understanding really what happens when you go through the second peak box. This is just the first the output of the first peak box. I've now looked at it. So I've got to understand what happens when, when I feed this. I'm going to feed the ball, not the, the measurement device. I'm going to feed the ball through the second peak box. So let me do that calculation for you. Here's the, the, here's the second peak box. Here's the output from the first peak box. Remember, the white is going to go down. And you're lucky that I don't have arbitrary amounts of time. Otherwise, I would really sit and make you do this on a piece of paper. But see, actually, yeah, before I tell you what happens, just think, OK? I've told you the rules. Those are all the rules that you really need. Okay, The white ball here goes through the peak box. The black ball goes through the peak box. But nothing is going to happen to the measurement device. It's sort of off on the side. So we follow the rules. And the rules are very natural. The white here comes through, becomes white, comma, black. The black comes through, becomes white, comma, negative, black. And now we're sort of in a situation that we haven't quite encountered before. Okay, like how does this whole thing simplify? And once again, the rules are exactly the rules of basic arithmetic. So I'm going to use, I'm going to write the equivalent rules from basic arithmetic down. Be careful, I'm not talking about, you know, these are physical devices, these are not numbers. So here is my white comma black again. It's like in the brackets I have 2 plus 5. But the, the other physical system is like multiplied by 9. I just pick random numbers. Not random. I just pick arbitrary numbers. <laughs> um, so the machine observing white is going to correspond to the number 9. The machine observing black is going to correspond to the number 17. Any old numbers would have done. I could have used letters, but people hate algebra, so I'll just, I'll just use some numbers. Here, I've got the white common negative black, so 2 minus 5. Okay. And we're saying, how does this thing simplify? Well, if, if you had to do that as just a mathematics problem, you would be happy with saying, well, I can expand these brackets out. This is 2 times 9 plus 5 times 9 plus 2 times 17 minus 5 times 17. Okay. I'll let you just look at it for a second so that you can be convinced I'm not cheating here. Okay. You're just expanding brackets, which is something you learn to do in arithmetic. So how is this rule going to apply when I apply it to the balls here, it's going to be exactly the same. I'm going to have like here 2 with this, plus or comma in our case, black with this, plus or comma white with this, comma negative black with this. I see some people who 
they look like they want to run for the door. We might need to lock that door. So here's what I just said. We get white with the machine pointing to white, black with the machine pointing to white, white with the machine pointing to black, and negative black with the machine pointing to black. Just same basic rules of arithmetic. But now, okay, let me remind you what we're doing here. We dropped a white ball into the first speed box. The machine observed the color. We did not observe the color. We didn't look at the machine. We didn't look at the, the white ball or anything. It went, this is here. It goes through the second beat box. Okay. Previously, there was a cancellation which got rid of the, the black ball. Okay. Previously, the black canceled with the negative black. They disappeared, and I was left with just a white ball. But now you can see that this black here is in a configuration where the machine points to white, whereas this black here is in a configuration where the machine points to black. These are no longer identical, just as in, in terms of the arithmetic, 5 times 9 is not going to cancel with 5 times 17. Okay. So you no longer get this interference. These configurations are different, they don't cancel, there's no interference. And that's the quantum physics explanation of why when the machine looks at, at the uh, ball, um, you start seeing random colors come out of the bottom again. Okay. That's very different to the explanation of what happens when you look at the ball. Okay. So notice, for example, that if I turn the light down or do something or, you know, cripple the machine in such a way that the machine cannot tell. If the machine itself didn't know what the color was, so it, it was always pointing to the question mark, then these two things are the same. I get white with the question mark pointer on the machine, and black, negative black with the question mark pointer on the machine. And now they will cancel each other out. So the machine is in the same boat as your eye. If it knows what the, what what the answer is, it sort of causes enough disturbance or something so that you get this re-randomization of the colors, but if it doesn't know, then the interference um, still happens. And uh, yeah, I spend a lot of my life trying to prevent machines looking at photons. It's harder than you might think. Okay, so here's what we learned. We learned that if you put a machine here, you get the same thing here, but it's a very different explanation of what's going on. It's now some other big complicated quantum state that really doesn't look the same. Right? And so you might ask, okay, well this was kind of a, you know, a dumb machine. What if one day we build robots or AIs or something? Should they be treated like machines, or should they be treated like us? Maybe even superior to us. This is the kind of thing Schrodinger knew, and I think is you know from probably the early 30s he was thinking about the what you know the what is life lectures were many years after that. Okay, so here I've asked the question: Well, okay, if we build a sufficiently intelligent robot. You know, should it act like us? Should it like really see what the color is? Or should it be like treated like the dumb machine where it becomes part of this giant mist? Okay. This problem that I've described to you, which is, which is typically known as the measurement problem in quantum theory, there's an alternative way of looking at it, which says, well, maybe it's we're the anomalous ones in that whole story. Okay. Maybe we are dumb and should be treated like the measurement device. So maybe what comes out of the peak box is this mist of white and black. At this point, I don't know what the color is, so in my brain I have a you know, question mark. But then I observe the color, and I go to the Schrodinger equation and I apply it to the ball and to me. And then I end up with a mist that has white and me thinking I saw a white ball, and black or me, and me thinking I saw a black ball. The problem with that is that when we do the experiment, you see one color or the other. Okay? You do not feel yourself disembodied into some giant mist. Okay? 
So the only way to make sense of this story that people have come up with is to say that the universe splits at this point. And in one universe, you see the ball is white. And in the other universe, you see the ball is black. And that's the origin of the many worlds interpretation of quantum theory. I am not going to bias you about um, interpretations. I think I should say at this point that this here is a mathematical object. I've tried to make it as you know, friendly as possible. But at the end of the day, it's a mathematical object. I called it a mist. You should not be thinking about clouds and fog and stuff. It's just a mathematical object. It's something we write down on a piece of paper that turns out to be the only way we can make sense of these experiments that involve peat boxes. So, you know, people, many people disagree, and over my career have you know, changed opinions many times as to how real you should think of this thing. But everyone agrees that it's at least a useful mathematical object for describing these experiments. OK, so we're now at the end of, of what I think I'm hoping will be the first lesson you take away from this talk. The lesson is that your choices have consequences. You can't kind of probe the physical world without causing something to go on. It's like you've walked into a, a china shop in the dark, and, and you, you, know, you start moving around, and, and you start smashing stuff. And every time you try and touch something, you smash it. And then you're looking at the pieces and trying to work out, oh, what was it before I smashed it? And quantum theory is like that. It's like you've got these big, fat fingers, and you, you can't probe what's really going on without having consequences for the thing that you are probing. And that's very different to a classical view of the world, what we, you know, the standard view of physics. OK. So this problem was known to the early founders of quantum theory, like Schrodinger and various people. And uh, Einstein actually came up with a way of trying to avoid this problem so that we, so that we can talk about what's really going on. And his way uh, was to use something that we call the principle of verticality. I'm now going to try and explain to you Einstein's argument and how he went through it in the same simple diagrammatic language. Okay. Um, good luck. All right. So here is the letter Einstein wrote to Schrodinger in 1935 where he laid out this argument. Unfortunately, he never published this argument. A really bad version of a related argument did get published. It was a mess. Unfortunately, it's, the resolution is not high enough for you to see. This is actually in German, as you might imagine. And he, you know, he did a few equations. And I'm going to explain to you those equations in the same language. Um, but the argument, in, I think, was quite beautiful. Uh, what Einstein sort of starts off by saying is, like, look, we've got these different states of the world, these misty states, quantum states. So, so far in this talk, we've only encountered four possibilities, and that's all we're going to need, really. We're going to we say a ball can be white, it can be black. It could be white, comma, black, i.e. it just came through from a peat box, or white, comma, negative, black. Those were the four possible states. And he was saying, should I think of these as real physical states? To a physicist, a real physical state is, is like a complete specification of the properties of that thing, such that you can derive any other property and any other behavior of the system. And he, was, he, was at, he wanted to advocate that these quantum states were not real physical states. That was the argument he was trying to make. And um, so this was the question. I think. It's sort of important to realize that this mist is just a mathematical object, it's not a physical thing. I can go draw it around a white ball or a black ball. Okay. It's, it's, it's just a part of the mathematical game. And in quantum theory, we do, we do do that. We treat these things all as just mist. Although it's more natural for us to look at the ball and see that it's white or black, in principle, you know, we could look at it and see that it's this or this. OK, so here's Einstein's, I think, really interesting argument in that letter to Schrodinger. It relies on using 
a mist that contains two bubbles in it. Okay. So here I've drawn this mist. It behaves very much like the mist that you've seen already, the quantum states you've seen already. This <coughs> describes a ball, ball one, and this describes ball two, and now the order within this configuration matters. Although they look identical the way I've drawn them on the up here, okay. Think that ball one is made of plastic and ball two is made of metal. Here's the plastic ball, here's the metal one. So this is ball one is black, ball two is black. Okay. And just as you might expect, if you go and observe ball one and you see that it's white, then you will know that ball two is white. Okay. Because when you make the observation, you're just sort of pulling out one of the alternatives. Okay. And so the, the crazy thing about a mist like this, so this is uh, something which might not have been the case, and in fact, for a while, Schrodinger speculated that it wasn't the case, but it turns out that it is the case. The crazy thing is that although I've drawn them close together here, remember this is just a mathematical object, in actual practice, I can separate these two balls as far as I want. Okay. And it doesn't like break the mist, it's not like it stretches out and, and becomes broken. Or so Einstein says, separate the two, the two balls, the two systems, and but do it in a way that you don't look at the color. So I've drawn that as like you put the ball inside a storage box that's built to shield it so that you can't see what color it is. And then he says, now look at the ball. Okay, so here you are. Now let Alice, he wasn't a very imaginative guy, he just called them A and B. Okay. I'll call him Alice and Bob. That's what we traditionally do in the field I'm in. So on the, on the side of A, of Alice, she looks at the ball, and she instantly knows that if she sees a white ball, then Bob's ball, the second ball, is going to be white. Similarly, if she sees a black ball, she knows that Bob's ball is going to be black. Okay. And Einstein uh, okay, then showed, in the, okay, that, that's a sort of fairly obvious thing when you look at this list. It's sort of obvious that that's uh, the way it works. But what he then showed, and I'll show you the calculation in a minute, but for the moment, just believe me that this is what happens, and let's talk about the consequences. So he said, Alternatively, before Alice looks at the ball, she can drop it out of the storage box and through a peak box first, and then look at the color. Okay. And when she does that, she will some of the time see a white ball, some of the time see a black ball. But what she will have done is change the state of Bob's ball to being white, comma, black, or being white, comma, negative black. The other kind of two possible misty states that we've talked about so far. So, by Alice's free choice of what she does here, she either does the peat box or she doesn't do the peat box. Okay. She can make a free choice over here and change which is the correct, you know, quantum theory is unambiguous about what is the correct state on the second ball should be used. And Einstein said, it's very implausible, I mean, I think he didn't even consider the possibility, that there was actually something happening, you know, to, to, between these two things, because quantum theory says they can be arbitrarily far away. This ball could be on, on the moon. In fact, it could be on Alpha Centauri. Okay. It could take years for, for, for Alice and Bob to separate from each other and, and to talk to each other. Okay. And quantum theory says this is what happens. And Einstein said, look, I believe there is some real state of the world of this ball, and it should not be the case that just by what someone does arbitrarily far away, it's changing the real state of the ball. But it is changing the quantum state, the misty state, and so therefore the quantum state is not a real state. Is that argument clear? Did I say it again? It's clear to you that the number of people who have misunderstood that argument far outweighs the number of people who have understood that argument. It, it seems like a sort of, you know, 
Unfortunately, as I said, he didn't publish it. He's just saying, look, the real state of affairs, here it is in his words. Okay. From this letter, this is uh, a translation of the German. Okay. The real state of B, of the second ball, thus cannot depend upon the kind of measurement I carry out on A, what he called the separation hypothesis. Okay. But then, for the same real state of B, Okay, he's just saying there's something that's a real state, I don't know what it is, but for the same real state, it's fixed. There are two, in brackets, in general, arbitrarily many, equally justified psi b. Remember, these are psi b. So he did the general version of this problem, I've just done the one where we, we get to two of these, and then two, but he said he did the very general proof of it. Okay. He said there's many different quantum states psi b, um, that depend on the measurement on A, and this contradicts the hypothesis of a one-to-one -one or complete description of the real state. So what he was saying is, there's something that's real out there, but the quantum state is not the thing that's real. Okay? Because I can make many different quantum states for this one real state. Okay? I think it's a killer argument. Um, I resolved when I was going to give this talk I said, you know, that I would not do anything Unless I can show you explicitly, because I am so sick of talks on quantum theory that use like Darwin and, and uh, you know make you believe things by analogy. So what I need to convince you of is this fact that there's a difference between when we put when Alice observes the ball directly versus when Alice does a peep box on that ball. Okay. So I'm now going to do that calculation for you. Uh, you can think of it as a bit of an aside if you if you don't want to. Uh, follow it through, but it's not particularly difficult. So we start with the two balls in this initial misty state of white, white, comma, black, black. And we put the first ball through a peak box. Okay. So the white becomes white, comma, black. But the second ball, which is far away, nothing happens to it. It just stays white. And the first ball here goes to white, comma, negative, black. And the second ball stays black. Okay, so that's natural given what we saw already uh, with the measurement device in the ball. Okay. Mathematically, let's, let me write it out to be concrete. You think of the white of the first ball as being like 2, and the white of the second ball as being like, uh, the black of the first ball, sorry, as being like 5, and so this is a bit like 2 plus 5, and then times 9 now refers to the second ball. Here it's 2 minus 5 times 17, which refers to the second ball. Okay. And similar to what we did before, you could sort of say, well, I open up the brackets, I expand out the brackets, I get 2 times 9 plus 5 times 9 plus 2 times 17 minus 5 times 17. Okay. And so that would tell us, if you just follow that rule, that after you put the first ball through the peak box, you have white, white, comma, black, white, comma, white, black, comma, negative, black, black. Okay, that negative, black, black is the same as this negative here. And now for the piece of extraordinarily difficult mathematics, the hardest thing that you're going to see today, which is, let's go back to thinking of this in terms of numbers. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to regroup the numbers in a slightly different way. I'm going to say, I'm going to take the 2 times 9 here and the 2 times 17, and I'm going to rewrite it. This is just rewriting. This is the exact same thing. This equals this. I take 2 times 9 plus 2 times 17, and I put the 9 plus 17 in brackets, and I get a 2 here. And similarly, I take the 5 times 9 and the minus 5 times 17, and I get 5 times 9 minus 17. It's just a standard rule of arithmetic. But in terms of the balls, it's quite profound. Because in terms of the balls, when I do this regrouping, you know, here I've regrouped on, on the numbers of the second ball. Here, here I've regrouped on the colors of the second ball. I now get white outside of white, comma, black. Okay, so that's this term here and this term here. Comma, black outside of white, comma, negative black. That's this one here and this one here. Okay. And now you see what Einstein claimed, which is that if you observe the first ball, 
remember it was the first wall that went through the peat box, but if you observe the first wall and see that it's white, then the second wall will have become white, comma, black. Okay. It's a very natural rule. If you observe the first wall as black, the second wall becomes white, comma, negative black. And that's exactly what he was using in this kind of argument. Okay. This we call quantum steering. It's like, it's, it's, it's problematic language because, well, depending on what you believe about the world, it's not like Alice is really steering Bob's state, but, but that's the language that we use. Okay, okay. so I think that this argument of Einstein is, uh, it should have been better publicized. Uh, it's, it, it's sort of a great argument. And in fact, this argument uh, I think was, you know, fully valid up until the point that John Bell came along sort of nearly, um, I guess it was 15, 20, about 20 years later. Okay. So John Bell is one of the great Irish physicists, and he took issue with this statement of Einstein that the real state of being must Oh, no, sorry. Einstein said, the real state of B thus cannot depend upon the kind of measurement I carry out of A. And Bell actually managed to show that this was wrong, and that the real state of B must depend on the kind of measurement I carry out of A. So even though A is arbitrarily far away, and even though Alice makes a free choice, remember that the title of this talk is Free Choice in Quantum Theory, Alice makes a free choice, Bell showed that Einstein's assumption of locality is completely incompatible with free choice between some measurements on ball one. Okay. It's quite a, uh, you know, I think it's, it's one of those features of the world that I think will still be relevant in hundreds of years' time. Okay. Even if quantum theory goes away, Bell showed that there is some kind of fundamental non-locality in nature. This argument of Einstein's is wrong. And uh, non-locality to a physicist is a very uh, distressing and disturbing thing. It's this kind of action at a distance. And so the ways that people have tried to get around that, well, we have things like this many worlds type interpretation. You can also try and get around this conclusion that way. Um, many people just say, well, there's just something wrong about thinking about things having a physical state, microscopic things having a physical state. The problem with that is that, as I said, our technology is now getting to the point, like I can see those, those holes are very small, but I can see them with my naked eye. At some point you have to say, well, you know, there's something real in the world. Okay. And uh, we, I hope we all agree about like real, the stuff that's really going on at the scale of you and me. Okay. We, we, we agree that there's a real world out there that, that something's happening. I'm not a solipsist. If I was, you would all be a lot better looking. <laughs> Probably made out of chocolate. Um, so realism is true at a macroscopic level. Somehow we call it into question now um, at, at the microscopic level. So here's the second lesson of the talk. Well, let's say the final lesson of the talk, which is that free choices made by a very distant, completely isolated person can affect the real physical state of the stuff around you. And what Bell showed was that, okay, you might not, you might not think that the quantum state is a real physical state. The beautiful thing about Bell's theorem is that it says it doesn't matter what you think is the real state. It doesn't matter. Quantum theory doesn't matter whether you're talking, you know, the quantum states, whatever it is, the real state of whatever around you, in order to explain the experiment that Bell came up with, it has to change based on something that happens arbitrarily far away. Yeah. And if that doesn't disturb you, nothing will. Okay. It's not only your own interventions in the world, but you know, the very thoughts that you're having right now could be dependent on what some monkey in Borneo has thrown some coconut off a tree. And that should worry you. Okay. So 
the let's come back to, to Schrodinger again. So Schrodinger knew at least all the stuff up until now. So he received this letter from Einstein that gave this argument, and he realized it for the great argument that it was, and he uh, immediately managed to prove that so he was, he was uh, you know, definitely better mathematically, I guess, than Einstein. He went off and proved the most general results about this whole kind of procedure. What can happen? He coined the term, so Einstein didn't give a term for the uh, for the state uh, of white, white, comma, black, black. Schrodinger gave it the term entanglement in English, and he also gave it the German term, the Schrenkel. And he wrote these two papers that, that sort of did the whole generalized version of, of what, what can happen when you take entangled states and start making measurements on them. Okay. And in like one, you know, maybe two sentences, he made some silly remark about a cat. And that's all anyone remembers about these two papers <laughs> from 1935. Okay. But even if you look at that sort of parenthetical remark about the cat, um, it's not clear whether he, he's making the... I mean, he, he's clearly making the argument that something is weird about quantum mechanics and we should be disturbed by it. It's not even completely clear whether he's making the argument that the cat is in a misty state like this, white, comma, black, or that you should think of the, the Geiger counter and the radioactive bottle and the hammer and so on as like the measurement device observing the count. Okay. He, knew, he knew sort of, of both options. And, but I think, you know, regardless of, of exactly what he was trying to say, it's clear that at that point, at least at that point in 1935, he started uh, engaging with the question of like, what is the role of a human in this physical theory? It's something that none of us like. And so that's why I think uh, we can we can say